I'm just here to um, speak a little bit about uh, why this program is important to us and why uh, we're glad that it's important to you too. Judging by this wonderful turnout, uh, there's some real interest in these programs and composting in particular, um, even on this stormy night. Um, so the city has been working really hard, as you know, to try to reduce our carbon footprint, to make efforts around waste aversion, energy, transportation, and these uh, residential environmental programs uh, really go a long way to help, um, uh, to help those efforts. Um, and composting in particular, you know, you might ask why is environmental services uh, running this one? Um, I guess it's not in natural areas or it's not elsewhere because um, the, the goals of the city and of our department are really to try to embrace uh, the three E's of sustainability. So going beyond just environmental sustainability, but to also recognize the social and the economic components, social equity. Um, and so uh, when it comes to composting, obviously there are many environmental benefits that include um, you know, diverting some wonderful, rich natural resources like yard trimmings and food scraps, keeping that out of our landfill where when it breaks down without oxygen, it releases methane, a pretty heavy duty greenhouse gas. Um, it also helps prevent stormwater runoff. When you add nutrients to your soil, it makes it healthier, richer, more able to absorb that water. So the, the environmental benefits of composting are pretty evident. Um, but there's also an economic component, which is to say, you know, I, I know I've purchased a lot of soil and a lot of compost in my life. So it's great to be able to provide that for your own family and maybe your neighbors. And that leads me to the social component where, you know, when you're composting in your backyard and you're talking to your neighbors about it, they might not have ever thought of that. They might just have their system for putting things in this bin or whatever. And so when you sort of suggest that there's another way to look at what's often considered waste, when you look at waste as a potential resource, it really can change the way you look at the world and can really bring neighbors together potentially. So I just wanted to put a little bit of that context in there, and uh, I'm really happy that you've all come out tonight. There's the possibility that there are other classes like this in the community. I think uh, the Sustainable Living Association offers a compost class annually. Um, I think it already passed for this year, but keep an eye out on their website. And then the gardens at Spring Creek often offer um, composting instruction. It's a good place to learn hands-on. Well, that's it for me, and um, let me just tell you a little bit about Natalie. Um, she has a master's degree from Colorado State University, uh, and her degree was in horticulture uh, with a focus on organic soil fertility, which is the perfect fit to be a, uh, a soil fertility instructor at Colorado State University, which is her current role. She also teaches at Ames Community College, and her, her courses are also involving uh, fertilizer and organic vegetable production. She's an avid home composter, as you probably imagine, and she's really excited to help you learn how to farm your own microbes tonight. So please give Natalie Yoder a warm welcome. So we're gonna start today with the clicker questions. So everyone get your clickers ready. Um, those handy dandy clickers are gonna tell us something about your current composting, and it might even help me tailor a little bit what I'm gonna talk about tonight. So if I know how many of you are already composting, for example. So let's start with those. So our first question is, in what age range are you? I'll give you another second, and 82 responses. Let's look at that. So the majority of you are in the 50 to 65 range, kind of interesting. Very few youngsters in here, but there is one. Let's find that one youngster, you know? Let's find that youngster. Wait, there's two up here. Did you guys click her in? Okay, good. Uh, do you rent or own your home? Okay, we're at 83. One more person participated this time. That's great. Lots of homeowners in here, awesome. Uh, do you use compost in your garden at home? I really wanna know this one. Okay, 82 responses. Most of you, yes. Uh, a couple don't have a garden, that's great to know. Um, and some no's in here, so there's a couple first time composters maybe. Do you currently compost at home? This will tell me if you're a first time composter or not. Wow, about half and half, that's perfect. That's perfect. Okay, how much do you know about compost? What? How do we get 84 this time? <laughs> That's incredible. Okay, a little bit. That's good. Nothing. We don't have a single pro in here. Really, not a single pro. Um, that's pretty good. But we have some people who know a lot about composting, and that's great. 
So for the folks who know a lot about composting, make sure to think about good questions for me for the end of the talk if I haven't gone um, quite in depth. What materials do you compost at home? And on this one, you can select many of them, so select all the ones you compost. Okay, so let's just look at this really quick, I'm curious. Lots of grass clippings, lots of food scraps, makes sense. Branches, twigs, paper products, leaves. Okay, so paper products are low, that makes sense. Lots of leaves, lots of food scraps, those are the majority. And then, what worries you about composting? This, this is a good question, especially for those who haven't composted yet. So not being successful is the number one compost worry. That's awesome, because I can help you be successful. I could also help you with smells and pests too, but I could really help you be successful. So that's great. Okay, so we're done with clicker questions. You can put it down. And, and now we're going to talk about compost. So for the first half of this talk, I'm just going to give you kind of a general overview of compost, maybe why it's good, and then we'll go into how to compost, right? Um, so save those how to compost questions and ideas for the second half of the talk because we'll really get into the details there. So whether you have one horse or maybe you have many cows or a couple goats or you just have some food scraps from your kitchen, compost is organic matter. It's a resource and we shouldn't waste it. That is the underlying message of the entire talk, that there's a reason that we shouldn't waste it because it's organic matter and organic mad matter is magic, um, but it's also not to be wasted. So how much of our trash, our current trash, is compostable food waste? Well, in 2010, Boulder County did a study and they found that approximately 13 to 15 percent of their food waste, I mean of their trash, was compostable food waste. We used those numbers to extrapolate, extrapolate what it might be for Larimer County and we found that maybe 13 to 17.4 percent um, is, is the current, that's how much compostable food waste is in our trash system. And so we're looking at something like 20,000 tons per year. So that's a lot of waste that goes into the landfill, goes into a trash system, and doesn't end up back in your own yard where it could, right? Maybe in your garden, or maybe in your neighbor's garden if you don't have a garden, but you just don't want to waste it. So that's in Fort Collins alone, right? 20,000 tons a year. 40,000 pounds, it's a lot of waste. So how do people compost? What are the methods of composting? And today I'm just gonna talk about what I would call active piles or bins. Um, that's just this presentation. I'm not gonna go into anything else. There are other options. There's passive piles. They require strange or different piping to make sure you're getting aeration to the center of piles. Um, also requires some special monitoring. There also is vermicomposting, right? And we have experts in town on vermicompost that you can buy great vermicompost in town, but you can do it at home, and I'm not gonna talk about it. It's a totally different system, um, and I encourage you all to do it. That being said, remember that vermicompost, or something you might learn about vermicompost, is that it doesn't process quite the same quantity at the same rate. So a lot of people normally have vermicompost bins as well as an active compost pile. So we're gonna talk about active compost piles and bins. There's another term you guys might hear, I'm not gonna use it in this uh, PowerPoint, but there's the term windrow. And a windrow just refers to um, a row of material kind of piled on itself. So it's a pile, but in row shape. But we'll talk about piles, since most of you seem like you might be home composters, you're not gonna have room for a 100 foot windrow in your backyard. So what are the benefits of composting? You guys probably already know some, and that's why you're here today, because you're interested in composting for one reason or another. One of the top benefits of composting is water conservation. Using compost in your gardens, in your landscape, actually is a great method of water conservation. And that's because compost improves water infiltr infiltration and it improves water retention. So we can hold water, but then we also can not let water stagnate because we have organic matter compost in our system. It feeds soil microbes, so our soil is a little bit more alive when we have a lot of compost. It's a slow release fertilizer, so it supplements our need to, do, to use quick acting um, synthetic fertilizers because it's a slow release. It diverts waste in the landfill, as we, as we mentioned earlier. And it reduces the volume of a material by 30%. And this is an obscure benefit. You have to think about, well, why do I care if it reduces it by 30%? Well, think about the volume. If that's going into the landfill and not composting, it's 
you know, sandwiched between all those layers of plastic, it, it takes up 30% more room on this planet, right? So we are reducing it down to something that's 30% smaller. Some other benefits would be minim minimizing pathogens, weeds, odors, and insect problems. Um, we can kill weeds and diseases and pathogens in properly managed compost piles. We can stabilize nitrogen and phosphorus compounds, which are often those compounds that tend to leach um, and cause a lot of water pollution issues uh, related, to, related to agriculture or gardening. And then it produces a marketable soil amendment, right? So it's something that, you know, you're, if you're buying it at the store already, you're saving yourself money by producing your own compost. Lastly, it sequesters carbon into a really stable form um, of organic matter and sinks it back into your soil. So sequestering that carbon is a, is a benefit that we talk a lot, a lot about when we talk about the impact, the carbon footprint of a city. So let's, come up, let's, let's all agree on this one definition for this talk of what compost is, right? Most important, it's managed. It's biological. It's an oxidation process, so it requires oxygen. And it converts heterogeneous material into a homogeneous, fine particle, humus-like material. That's the basic definition of compost. Extremely basic. What is managed? It's what you do. You are the managers of the compost pile. Compost cannot happen without some sort of management. Well, it can happen on a very slow, slow, small level, but, but on a large level with you involved, uh, that's the manager, right? That's the compost. So what do you do? You're gonna provide carbon and nitrogen C and N at a ratio of 30 to 1. It's a very strange ratio. Where do we come up with this ratio? Where this ratio is based on microbes, the microbes that are making your compost for you. And that's what else you're going to do is you're going to farm microbes, right? So you're going to provide oxygen for the oxidation process. We have here 5 to 50 percent. That's a really hard number to witness with your eye when you're making a compost pile. So you just want to vaguely think, oh, these guys need oxygen. So we need to have pore space in there, right, for oxygen. And then we need to provide moisture. And the moisture, we say, is about 50%. And a really good touchy-feely way of talking 50% moisture is to say about the moisture content of a wrung-out sponge. So if you think about a wrung-out sponge, it's moist to the touch. It's not sopping wet. It's not going to leak water, right? So you can grab your compost and feel it once you've added water and know that it's about the, tech, the, the moisture of a wrung out sponge. Okay, so I said it was 30 to 1, right? And we've seen that you guys are composting all sorts of stuff in your backyard. So let's talk a little bit about what that might mean in those different things that you're composting. So we, we have browns and we have greens. And we'll call anything that's brown something that's higher than 30 to 1 ratio, which means it has more carbon than nitrogen at a ratio higher than 30 to 1. It's got a lot more carbon. And then we'll call something green, something that's really high in nitrogen, and that's going to have something less than 30 to 1. Now, we do have ash up there, you'll notice, and it's, it can be around 25 to 1, but it doesn't act quite the same as greens, and so it's in, also in the brown section. So, you know, there's really important lessons to be learned with this. I remember one time when I first composted and I was in a really urban environment and someone's landscaping crew was coming through and taking away all the leaves, I didn't know what kind of browns to put in there, so I was putting newspaper. Well, you'll notice here that newspaper shredded is 175 to 1. And so it's really easy, if you don't know 100, it's 175 to 1 and you treat it, say, like leaves, which are 60 to 1, let's say you put as much newspaper in as you were putting leaves in, well, then you would get a pile that's ratio of carbon to nitrogen was way out of whack. It'd be way higher than 30 to 1, right? So it's really important to understand and kind of investigate what your carbon, what your brown to green ratio is, and try to hit that 30 to 1 rate. Now, you'll notice on here that it also says that weeds are 30 to 1, right? Well, that's true, but if I just made a pile of weeds, would it be compost? Probably not, right? So it takes more than just knowing 30 to 1 because we have to think about maybe those weeds would compact, there would be lack of oxygen in there, they might be too much moisture because they're green weeds. Um, so there's a lot more than just that 30 to 1. So when we're looking at this, you might consider your grass clippings as greens 
And you might consider all those peanut shells that you have for some strange reason as browns. Um, your fruit waste can actually be a lot higher than you would think, right? 35 to 1. I might have intuitively considered it a green, but knowing it's 35 to 1, it kind of counts a little bit as a, as a brown there. Corn stalks are pretty high as well. So keep that ratio in mind, 30 to 1. That's the magic number we're looking for. Okay, so it's, so it's biological, right? It's managed and it's biological. So what is biological? What is, well, it's what microorganisms do. And we'll call microorganisms MOs or microorganisms, whichever you prefer, but you'll see it as MOs in this presentation. So there are many species, species of bacteria and fungi that metabolize the carbon to nitrogen to grow and multiply and they use oxygen and water in this process. So that's why I said composting is farming microorganisms. You're just feeding a pile of microorganisms. That's the whole point of composting. You're asking these microorganisms to make something nice for you and you're giving them the right environment to do it. And a really important part of that in that composting, um, in that farming of microorganisms is just understanding what they need, right? So they need that 30 to 1, they need that oxygen, and they need that water. So what's oxidation? Oxidation is the presence of air. And all we need, well, the microorganisms need it for respiration, but all we need to give that compost windrow or pile air is some sort of aeration, right? Some pore space in there. And we can create that pore space just based on the type of material that we use. Because it's heterogeneous, right? It's nice and chunky, everything's different sizes and shapes. It kind of doesn't lay flat to each, to each other, so we end up creating that pore space. So that use of bulking material um, and the turning that we're going to do with our compost is going to ensure that we constantly have oxygen available to those microorganisms. Here's a great pile picture. Um, it kind of just looks like a pile of leaves, but it's a pile of many things all mixed in there. You can see it's nice and heterogeneous looking, right? It's nice and, um, I don't know, it looks like it definitely has some air involved, but probably could hold some moisture, but probably also has some good drainage. So remember, this is not just the science of composting, this is also the art. And this, is, this can get t as touchy-feely as you want, like, oh, this just feels like the right compost, and it just seems like it has good drainage, or you could get out there and measure the temperatures, and you could measure how much water is in there. So either, either direction, I'm just giving you the basics. You could go art or science with it, either way. So um, the heterogeneous organic matter that we're talking about can be those feedstocks, right? The kitchen scraps the bedding, the waste hay, the spoiled feed or grain. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I compost a lot of brewing grain because my boyfriend's a very serious home brewer, and so I'm constantly composting brewing grains. Um, leaves and grass clippings are great. Horse manure is really great. Just about any manure is really great. Um, some manure is hotter than others, and when I say hotter, I mean more nitrogen than others, right? It's greener. Like chicken manure is greener than horse manure or cow manure. And if you had some sort of like swine slurry, which I don't think you could have that in the city of Fort Collins in your backyard. But if you did, or you got your hands on it, that stuff would be super high in nitrogen. And it would also have lots of moisture in it. Um, so there's lots of material available to you to compost. If, for example, you are worried, you have a whole bunch of kitchen scraps, and you don't have enough carbon, you can get really creative with it and you could use newspaper, but remember 175 to 1, don't use too much of it. Um, and you can start petitioning your local landscape company to drop off all their leaves at your house, which I've also done. And I have a lot of leaves at my house now because of it. So we're turning that heterogeneous material into a homogeneous fine particle humus-like material. This is the final product. This is what we're looking for. Okay? So we've covered the entire definition of composting. We're back to clicker questions. Everyone get those clickers out. Okay, I currently dispose of yard trimmings via. So how do you get rid of your yard trimmings? You might realize this is a question that probably has something to do with the city and maybe ideas about yard trimmings in the future. Okay, so backyard composting, 31%, that's great. Trash, 25%, don't do that anymore. Makes me very upset. Okay, compost that. Uh, curbside pickup and drop-off locations, excellent. 
And then other. Whoa, what is other? Is that that you don't mow your grass? Or you have horses, or you have goats. Oh, that's a great idea. But then you have manure. Are you composting that manure? Great, OK. Um, my preferred way to dispose of yard trimmings would be, if available, I'm going to find you if you answer trash. OK, backyard composting, 3% trash. Who are you? Um, curbside pickup, no, no judging here. You can throw in the trash. It's fine. It's not my place to judge. Or throw it at my house. Is that, isn't that equivalent to trash? Put it at my house. Um, drop off location, OK, all right. But most everyone wants to do backyard composting. I probably loaded that question. I'm really sorry. With that earlier threat, <laughs> that was not good. I need to watch myself. I currently dispose of food, food scraps via. OK, so uh, the answer is 95 people are here all of a sudden. And 37% are putting it in the trash. Um, and 27 composting and garbage disposal, which is a great. Can I just plug something really quick right now? If you're going to throw away food, you should put it in the garbage disposal and not in the trash can because it goes down the system and into waste treatment and actually goes back somewhere afterwards than into a landfill. So if you want to throw away food, that is definitely the better way to do it. OK, um, my preferred way to dispose of food scraps would be, oh, I kind of jumped short. Sorry, three people. Um, backyard composting, excellent, and garbage disposal. Oh, see, I loaded that question too. I gotta stop this. Hi, everyone. My name is Caroline Mitchell. I also get to work in the Environmental Services Department here at the City of Fort Collins on waste reduction and recycling. I got a chance to speak to many of you at our table in the back of the room, but for those of you that I didn't get to speak to yet, I just wanted to let you know about a couple of opportunities we have tonight and coming up this summer. So one is we have a sign-up sheet in the back of the room for our sustainability services email newsletter. It comes out once a month. We also are going to be undertaking a really important project this summer. Um, for the last 20 years, we've had an ordinance called the Pay As You Throw Ordinance. And it sort of tells the trash haulers, it, it provides parameters around how they provide trash and recycling service to all the residents in the city of Fort Collins. So it's the ordinance that says if you order trash service, you automatically get recycling bundled in together for no additional charge. It's time for sort of a, a, a facelift and update to that ordinance. And we're going to be considering um, whether any parts of that ordinance should apply to businesses and multifamily parts of our community, because currently it does not. We'll also be talking about some different aspects of yard waste collection in the community and how those should tie into the ordinance. So we're at the really early stages right now. We don't really have the details to discuss yet, but we will really soon. So if you would like to keep in the loop and be part of that conversation, I have a second sign up sheet. If you're interested in both, you're going to have to write your email address down twice, and I apologize for that, but they are different things. So we have two different sign up sheets. So again, the sign-up sheet that's over next to the recycling information is the sign-up sheet just saying, hey, Caroline, send me an email when you're at that point where you have topics that we're all ready to discuss. So um, I, in advance, welcome your participation in both those programs. Thank you, and back to composting. So we had some really great questions during the break. Um, some of them will be answered in this next section. And uh, a lot of your ideas and questions are going to drive where I'm going. So if you do have some questions pertinent to the slide, don't hesitate to ask. I'm happy um, to talk about questions that have to do with the slide. If you have questions about your home composting system, we'll save those to the end so that way I can go into more detail with you. Um, yeah, so uh, one question that was during the break that was great um, had to do with that list that I had of those ratios, those carbon to nitro nitrogen ratios, and how you can get that list. Well, like we said, this PowerPoint will be available online. Um, you can, if you're a very savvy computer user, uh, Google has just about every answer. So you could say, what is the C to N ratio of blank? And it will come up. Um, or you could just not care about the C to N ratio. Listen to what I just said, which is that wood has really high C, right? So newspapers made of wood, really high C. And just remember that, that's super high. Leaves, medium, right? And all your food waste is a little bit lower. If you remember those rules, you can make compost. This is an art and a science, and an art, right? So, um, so that's the answer to that question. And if you really need that list, we can always go back to it, and you can take notes from it. So let's talk about 
how to make compost. About half of you are composting at home already. So I'm going to tell you something you might already be doing and you might already know. But you might get a little nugget of information or something new. So there's lots of different scales that you can do composting on. There's lots of different tools you can use for it and materials you can use for it. Um, two things pictured here is a small farm bucket loader. So a little bucket loader tractor used to turn things. If you have a couple acres and some horses, this might be useful for your pile, right? If you say have a small urban lot, you might be using five gallon buckets to move things around and a couple tools, or maybe you're a little larger and you're using a wheelbarrow. So there's lots of different scales that we can compost at. I do have one picture in here of compost being turned on a really large commercial scale, and I'll show you and talk to you a little bit about that tool, just because it's kind of neat to know where the compost you're buying in the store, how that stuff is turned, right? Okay, so the first thing you're gonna do when it comes to compost is you're gonna choose a site. So what are you gonna think about when you choose a site? Well, is, maybe it should be a mowed area. You don't want tons of weeds growing on it. Nice mowed area would be nice, smooth, slightly sloping would be great that would help with drainage so if you get a lot of rain it doesn't all seep into your compost and all of a sudden all your microorganisms turn into anaerobic microorganisms because there's no air available and it's all water right so something sloping would be really useful um, if you have something sloping a lot you might consider that a bad site because there might be a lot of runoff anytime you try to water your compost you might lose a lot of that moisture you want to be near your feedstock source so if you have a manure pile, if you have animals, you wanna be kind of close to there so you're not having to move things far. Um, for a lot of us, that's gonna be like, we're in our kitchen and we wanna take our kitchen scraps to the backyard. So if you have a back 40, which I don't know how many people have that in Fort Collins, um, don't put it at the end of that back 40 because you have to walk all the way to take your food scraps there, right? You wanna be relatively close to the house so you're not walking far. You wanna be in your water. And that's super important. Matter of fact, it's the most important in Colorado because water is something you're gonna to have to add to your compost pile because it can dry out really easily in our kind of arid and low humidity environment. But then there's a little caveat there. It needs to be at least 100 feet away from waters of the state. So that means you're not gonna contaminate someone else's water, right? So you need to make sure that you're being kind and polite when it's about how close you are to water. Um, you wanna control your runoff and your run on. So runoff in particular, let's say you are on a really sloping site or you're getting a lot of rainfall and you're getting a lot of runoff. Uh, one thing that's really useful is get some straw bales. Put those on that, that down slope so it catches some of that moisture and stops it from moving. So runoff is something to consider. And then sun or shade, does it matter? Any, who thinks it matters? Sun or shade? I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters. I mean, some people argue about it, but like you could, you know, they make their own heat, put them in the shade. If you put them in the sun, they might dry out a little bit more, but they don't. I mean, this is, that's kind of the last consideration when it comes to this type of composting. Again, if you're in a really sunny hot spot, you might dry out a little bit. Um, that would be the only concern. And then something not windy, right? So the more wind that you have passing by your pile, the more evaporation you're gonna have from that pile. So you'll lose a lot of moisture. Something really important to consider too is maybe your neighbors. I hope that all of you after this talk won't be making stinky compost. So, but just in case you go out of town, you forget to turn it, your boyfriend puts 20 gallons of brewer's grain in there and forgets to tell you and something gets a little putrid, you might consider like, I don't know, not putting it right next to your neighbor's fence so that it wafts into their kitchen all day long. Um, so that's a nice consideration. There are, as far as um, the city goes, you're allowed to compost. There's not, you know, just don't be a nuisance with your compost. Don't cause problems for your neighbors and don't draw in bad things like maybe lots of critters, right? So that's what you're gonna think about when you're choosing your site. Okay, you're gonna build a pile. And this is the only slide I have about building a pile and I wanna note that there are hundreds of different styles of compost. Matter of fact, if you just wanna have a fun afternoon, Google compost piles and then hit images and then look at all the images. There's so many different types of compost piles and people get really elaborate with it. Um, here are two really common, simple, cheap or free compost piles that you can make. This one's a pallet style compost pile where it's got three pallets and you can enter from the front and then you can place a pallet 
to keep maybe your dog out of it or something in front and then move that pallet when you need to access it. This is just fencing in a circle. So there are lots of cheap ways to make compost pile. Matter of fact, you don't even need sides for a pile. You could just make a pile. I think that's why it's called a pile, actually. You don't need sides for it, right? So you could just make a pile. Um, there are, and this is a note that I'm remembering to bring up because of questions at the break, there are different types of compost bins that you can purchase on the market. I'm fine with you purchasing any of them, but I would hesitate to suggest that you purchase one of those tumblers. The reason being, as you've learned what compost needs, think about that tumbler, right? A lot of those tumblers don't get great air. A lot of those tumblers, when you start tumbling them, they just tumble the mass into a giant ball of goo, you know? And it's hard sometimes to drain moisture, so you tend to get too wet in there. You tend to not allow, you can't mix it quite right when it's in those tumblers. And then they're also exposed to elements on all sides. So I'm gonna show you in a second about thermal mass of compost piles. You wanna get a pile. If you have something that's exposed on all sides, there's a lot of downfalls to that. So those tumblers can be modified. So if you have one at home, I'm very sorry, I didn't mean to talk bad about your tumbler, but you could take a stick and you could stick it in the tumbler and you can wedge it in there so it's kind of crossed, maybe at some sort of angle. So as you're turning that tumbler, it's giving it an extra flip of material and breaking up that glob that is trying to be created. Some of, some of them, I guess maybe they, they've heard my rant before and they started putting these rods in there to make it a little bit better. Um, so the square plastic composters work fine. Um, anything, anything is fine. You can put any, anything that you can put a pile inside and maybe access that pile to turn it, which we're going to talk a lot about turning. And then it says here, manage the batch as continuous pile or, as, or a little differently, right? So you could batch or continuous. A batch pile, I would consider like, I have a whole bunch of feedstock. I've got manure, I've got a big pile of leaves. I'm going to put water, I'm going to mix them up, I'm going to leave them, they're going to compost. I just made my compost. A continuous pile is when you're taking your food scraps from your kitchen and you want to keep adding to that pile because you're always making food scraps. So that would be a continuous pile. There is some gray space in between. I treat my continuous pile a little like a batch pile where I just add and add add some carbon, add some nitrogen, add some carbon. Month goes by and I feel like, oh, I've got a good amount of matter there. And then I treat it as a batch pile, right? I'll turn it and I'll treat it like it's one single batch from there. And I won't add any more to it. And that's another big thing to note. If you are going to make compost, you probably need to stop adding new stuff to it, right? At some point. And so one thing I really like about some of these free materials or open piles is that you can have multiple of them very easily. So whenever I've built these pallet piles, I always build two to three bays in the pallet piles so that I can move all my material as it's finally full and I've added all my kitchen scraps to the second bay. And then I can use that first bay again to start adding new material. So that second bay is allowed to compost. No new material added. That's the big downfall of the tumblers. People keep putting new material, new material, new material, and you're never gonna have ready compost because you always have some banana peels in there that didn't have time to compost. Is that all I wanted to say about that? Another thing I want to note too, remember what I said about Colorado, it's super dry for compost. Maybe not this week, it's really raining out there. But look at the way this meshes, right? There's a lot of air contact on a lot of surface area. So if I were going to build a pile like this, then I do care if it's in the sun. And I do care if it's near any sort of breeze, right? Because this pile is getting dried out from all sides. Those black plastic bins, don't dry out as much. So those are great when used properly in Colorado. Pallets actually do a really good job of keeping in a good amount of moisture too. So that's a great, um, great compost bin. And then lastly, I want to talk, remember we said we want somewhere that, that's mowed, maybe an even surface, slightly sloped. There's a lot of talk about putting bottoms on compost bins. Not necessary. You can if you want, but it just makes it a lot harder to turn. So you could, your compost is free to be in contact with the soil and probably only benefits it because when you get to those later stages, you have a lot of soil microorganisms that can interact with your compost. Okay, so let's talk about turning your compost. Uh, well, I, so there's a couple different ways to turn it, but it's always easier if you have more than one pile because you can be concentrating on just turning and then have another pile that you're stacking and adding and layering, right? 
there's different scales. Again, there's tractor scales. And then my favorite tool is a pitchfork. Digging forks I don't think work as well. And when you have that really heterogeneous material, I don't think shovels work very well either. They do make some really fancy little compost turners, and those seem worthless. So I would definitely say get a pitchfork, use a pitchfork. Um, I want to say watch your back. And the reason I want to say watch your back is because sometimes I get a little excited about compost. And when I was like 20 years old, I threw my lower back out turning way too much compost. And uh, you know, I just got too excited and I really liked my pitchfork and I was trying to use it all the time. And I tried to move too much material into my second bay at once. So watch your back when you're turning this stuff. It can be heavy when it's moist material. So in this image, we have my favorite style, the three bin, three, I mean, some people don't have the space for this, but the three bin or three bay pallet system. Um, and below, we have something that is sometimes called a scarab, but it's also just a large scale tractor compost turner. And it is a mess of little fingers and blades that chop and turn as they roll along a windrow. Just a really cool way to think of how someone on a large scale is turning the compost, right? Um, so you're going to essentially try to do that, but with your pitchfork in your pile. Okay, so we've, we're, we talked about what kind of piles you might have and how you're going to turn those piles. So remember, you're going to turn the pile, at least for the type of composting we're talking about today, you're going to turn the pile. And if you don't want to turn the pile, then you're doing something called passive composting, right? You're not actively composting. And a lot of what I'm about to talk about next is not going to happen in your pile, and you're not going to get some of the benefits of that in your pile. So there was a question during the break about the potential of things like listeria in piles that don't get hot, or so let's say pathogens in piles that don't get hot. And that's the downfall of not turning your pile, is that you normally can't control that all of the matter in your pile gets hot. And why is that? Well, that's because in a pile, we find that the center of the pile, the mass of the microbes, is where the heat is retained, right? We're losing heat from all of the sides, and this heat is because those microorganisms are metabolizing. And like us, when they metabolize, them, they metabolize, they radiate heat. And so they're heating up the center of this pile, and we're losing heat from the sides. And, and that center area, that hot area, is where we want all of the material to eventually hang out in for a while to ensure that we're actually fully composting it and that we're getting the benefits of compost. This says three to six feet tall, but yeah, how do you turn six feet with a bucket loader? You turn six feet with a bucket loader, no, but you can turn six feet very slowly with a pitchfork. Um, and you may not get to three feet. You're definitely not gonna get to three feet if you're just slowly adding kitchen, kitchen scraps. And that's why I said, I kind of treat mine like a continuous slash batch pile where I add and add and add and I'm layering and it's starting to compost and it's getting hot but I'm ignoring that heat and I'm then going to turn it once I get it to about three feet tall I'm then going to turn it and pretend that's its first cycle of truly heating up so because I really want my matter to make sure my mat my material is getting hot in the center so we're going to monitor this pile we've made our pile we understand kind of how we're going to turn the pile how are we going to monitor it monitor it and what do we want to look at Remember, this is an art and a science. The art side of it is how much of this you want to do. A lot of it can be touchy-feely, it's okay, but if you really want to make a product that you feel safe putting on your food, um, that you feel safe composting maybe manure from animals, you might consider heavily monitoring your pile. So you want to check the compost uh, with a compost thermometer. I brought some compost thermometers today. I actually didn't bring them. Susie did, Susie Gordon. And I wanted to show you what one looked like. If I can open this box, I should have done this beforehand. They're just a super long thermometer. They're a super long thermometer so that they can go to the center. Well, let's see, if you had a three foot tall compost pile, that would easily go to the center of your pile so you could get the true center temperature of your pile. So you would check your temperature of your pile with a compost thermometer. Um, heat is an indicator of biological activity. As the pile gets hotter, that means there's more microbes and they're metabolizing more carbon and more nitrogen. The goal for your compost pile is 130 degrees Fahrenheit for at least 15 days. 
That's not 15 days in a row. That's just 15 days over the cycle of a couple turns, and we'll talk about that. So that 130 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a really important range because that's when we start seeing the benefits of killing pathogens and diseases. If you're going to, say, compost a tomato that looked like it was kind of diseased last year in your garden, I would say you probably want to get even hotter than that for 15, for 15 days. But for most path pathogens like E. coli, salmonella, this would be adequate for ridding it of your compost. You're going to graph these heating cycles. And, by, and you're going to graph them. You can either do it kind of in your head or you could do it on paper, right? So you're going to graph these heating cycles. And I'll show you a graph that we've made of a compost that we did and tell you how you could use the same graph and how it tells you when to turn the pile. And then there, there's my note, proper heat management. Proper heat management. It can't just get hot once, because if it just got hot once, just in the middle, then that outside with weed seed is going to spread weed seed when you put it on your garden. So proper heat management um, kills weeds and diseases present in your feedstock. Not all, but most weeds and diseases present in your feedstock. OK, so here's my little chart. Let me tell you guys how to read this chart. Here's a compost pile I made, right? And on day one, there's our, our making of the compost pile. We're around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the thermometer telling me it's 50 degrees Fahrenheit. These tri this triangle line is the first round. So after day one, by day two, I'm at 120 degrees Fahrenheit. By day three, I'm at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a quick rise in temperature in the center of that pile. That is a hot pile. I have seen piles that steam like no one's business, or that you put your hand in and it feels like, oh, this could burn me, this is super hot. That's what we're looking for. We want that hot pile. But if we keep monitoring that pile, we'll see that, oh, we're up in that 130 range, and then we're starting to dive down a little bit, and it's not really heating up again. Time to turn the pile. So we turn the pile, and when we turn it, surprisingly enough, it goes right back down to 50 degrees. But by, by day two, we're up to 110 degrees, then up to 120. And again, we get this nice curve in the pile. So day 10 comes along, and I'm at 100 degrees. And this right here is to your discretion. If you don't get around to turning it, and it gets down back to 50 degrees, turn it again. You'll get this second spike. What is most important is not when you turn it on the down slope, but how long it stays hot, and what the curves look like as you're turning it. So you'll notice here, on my fourth turn, I'm not gaining so much heat anymore. And that's an indicator to me that my compost is getting close to done. Okay, now remember I said it's an art, so you don't have to make this graph. This would be a pain in the butt, and a lot of us are really busy, right? So the idea being invest in a compost thermometer. Do your continuous pile and don't worry about it until you're ready to turn it into a compost. Then batch it, mix it, take temperature, and just keep an eye on it. Oops, I forgot to take temperature for a couple days. Take temperature again and know that two days ago it was way hotter than today. Well, you know you're getting about to the range when you need to turn it. So you'll notice, too, that all, for this compost pile, it was around day 10 for the first two turns and day 9 for the second two turns. Compost has been equally successful if you just say, I'm going to wait two weeks, then turn it. I'm going to wait two weeks, then turn it. I'm going to wait two weeks, then turn it. This just allows you to make compost really quickly. So if you want to make compost quick, this is the way to do it. If you want to make compost lazy, just do it every two weeks. Turn your compost pile. Just make sure you're incorporating that outside, that outside material. Turn when your temperature decreases. And then after turning, monitor the heat cycle, if you're choosing to monitor it. And then check that moisture. That moment of turning is a great moment to add moisture back into it. Sometimes I'll bring a hose, and I'll kind of just you know, set it on its sprinkler setting on its uh, hose end setting and lean it against my pile and turn it into that hose area so everything's getting kind of moist. Though it's really helpful to have a second person hosing down the pile as you're turning it. Um, yeah, so remember to check that moisture. And then you're going to repeat the turnings until the temperature ceases to rise. That's about four to five turning cycles. So I just want to talk a little bit about winter composting. This is the photo from a lady in town and her compost pile and her geese who were huddled over her compost pile in the snow because the compost was warm. Historically, people used the heat that compost 
makes to their benefit. They would have a greenhouse, per se, Holland. You're in Holland. You have a glass greenhouse. They don't insulate. You put, a com you put compost on the floor, put some chickens in there. That heat from that compost heats your greenhouse, right? There's lots of ways that people have used heat from compost in the past. So if you have a pile with enough thermal mass and it's hot in the middle and you're kind of managing it, it will keep composting all winter long. If, say, you didn't get to it, you haven't turned it in six months and winter comes, well, just leave it there and wait till winter's gone and then turn it, right? So there's no, there's no harm in doing that. So winter composting, it, I mean, zero degree days outside, it'll be 85, 90 degrees in the middle of that compost pile. Okay, so now you've made your compost and you know it's done, it's the last curve and the curve's really low and it's not getting hot anymore and it's been a year and for some reason you took a year to do five turns. Um, what are you gonna do with your compost? Well, you're gonna go through a curing phase. And when you buy commercial compost, if you've ever heard anyone say, watch out for commercial compost, you need to test it, you need to see if it's ready, if it's ready, what does that mean? Well, often it doesn't go through that curing phase. That curing phase is a really important phase in compost and is often overlooked by home composters and commercial composters. So when that temperature curve flattens, we have these mesophilic microorganisms that invade the pile. And they do different things than those thermophilic hot microorganisms do. Those mesophilic organisms um, have a lot of benefits. So you need, you need those microorganisms to finish the pile for you. And then you need to make sure your windrow is still, your windrow, your pile, remember interchangeable here, even though windrows I picture really, really big. Um, you need to make sure there's still moisture in there, though these microorganisms don't need as much moisture and they're not as active as those thermophilic hot microorganisms. So if you're a little shy of 50%, it's probably better. You want a shy of 50, a little bit under 50. Um, and you're gonna cure it for one to two months. One to two months. Why cure? So what does it do to cure the pile? Well, it assures a higher quality product. Um, by higher quality product, I mean that the pH shifts to neutral. So you can have all sorts of strange pH shifts, but if you wanna apply a neutral, stable product, we're gonna apply it when, after it's cured because the pH shifts to neutral. The soil microorganisms recolonize the compost and they impart disease-suppressing qualities to the compost. So that's a really important benefit that we want in that compost. And then they can take care of that little bit of imbalance that might be left between your carbon and nitrogen. So I told you about the C to N ratio. So what happens if your C to N ratio is off, right? If we have too much carbon and not enough nitrogen, your compost is really slow. Right? You're not going to get a lot of heat from it, a lot of activity from it. It's going to be really slow. If you have too much nitrogen to carbon, it can be really hot, really hot, too hot. But most of the time what we see before we see that kind of problem with nitrogen is that we see, because of the type of materials that, that provide nitrogen, we see that waterlogged, we see um, anaerobic decomposition, you lose that pore space. So the either side is not good. So What's really not good is when you have too much carbon left in your, in your compost and you put it in your garden, the microorganisms are still there and they still wanna break down that carbon. And so to break down that carbon, they need nitrogen. So they're gonna rob your soil of nitrogen. They're gonna eat the nitrogen in your soil in order to break down that carbon. So that's why curing is really important because we wanna to get to that stage when we have a nice ratio of carbon to nitrogen. And you know this is a general statement, but it makes compost uh, optimum for plant growth. Okay, so when is my compost done? After the heating cycle stops, right? After we've cured it. Um, and then we're gonna check for that homogeneous, really fine, nice material. Matter of fact, most of the time, you've put something weird in there, like an avocado pit, that thing did not compost. Doesn't matter, it didn't go in the landfill. Put it back in there, screen it out. I always like to screen my compost to get that really fine material. So I take a screen and I'll put it over my wheelbarrow and I'll put shovelfuls of my compost on that screen, kind of sift it through into my wheelbarrow, then take it into the garden. 
just gives you that extra benefit. Uh, the question was if we could use a window screen, and the window screen is too, probably too small, uh, but mostly too small because that homogeneous material, if it were completely dry, probably could go through that window screen, but it's gonna be moist, it's gonna be full of life, it's gonna have some insects in it, you want those things in your compost. Um, so I would say like quarter inch screens, like yeah, hardware cloth, um, yeah, you could use chicken wire overlapped on each other so that you get a little smaller than the chicken wire because that can be pretty big. Um, and a couple things I always see when I sift my compost, uh, avocado pits, you'll see those forever. Um, and you will see some eggshells that didn't break down, right? And you will definitely see eggshells if you didn't crunch them up before you put them in the compost pile. So crunch those eggshells up before you put them in the compost pile. Do they compost 100% or not? Who knows? but they're good for the soil. There's no reason not to have them. They're calcium, right? And so whether or not they 100% compost in your compost, they're still good for your compost. No harm in putting them in there. The question is, if you need to cure, if you need to turn during the curing phase, and the answer is no. During the curing phase is, this, is a passive resting period. There is no, the thing, the reason you don't have to turn is because turning involves, it's, it's about the heat, getting everything to the heat in the middle. And because the curing phase is not a hot phase, you don't need to turn during that time. Great question. Okay, you want that earthy smell in your compost. If your compost smells rancid, if it smells like cow manure or like ammonium, it is not done. You want that nice earthy smell in the compost. And that earthy smell is actually a byproduct of actinomyces, which is a, a soil bacterium. So when that soil bacterium is in your compost pile in high enough quantities, um, your compost pile has that great earthy smell to it. So that, that's a good telltale sign. And then, and I'm gonna, hopefully we'll have a little giveaway of this test later on, because they're not super affordable, unfortunately. There are maturity tests available on the market. There are some home ones that you can use. Um, I have used them to kind of success, might be kind of helpful, um, but there's a Solvita test, and that Solvita test checks for carbon dioxide and ammonium in your compost. And if you have high levels of either, that's a telltale sign that it's not finished yet. So you can get tests. They're about $136 for a kit that gives like six tests. So that's a little too expensive for almost all home composters, especially since everything so far has been free. If it has too high of carbon dioxide, or if it has, well, First of all, the home test tells you what to do depending on which one is high. And if, but if both are high, it's not ready and you could let it keep curing. If you had just, say, um, high carbon dioxide, it might have to go back into a, a, another turning stage, but most of the time the curing stage will take care of that. The only reason we ever have to go back into that turning stage is if we thought we didn't heat something up enough to kill the weed seed or kill disease, because that passive type of composting, and all of us have done it on accident or on purpose, where we just make a pile and we leave it and two years later it looks beautiful, that makes great compost. It's just that safety issue and that issue of making something actively that doesn't absolutely won't smell, that we want to be active and turning it and getting it hot. So you could let it cure at that point if you're too high in ammonium or carbon dioxide. Okay, so to assure quality. We are gonna keep meat, cheese, and bones out of our compost. Why do we keep meat, cheese, and bones out of our compost? Really? Come again? Someone say something? I thought I heard something. Critters. critters, exactly. The number one reason is critters, right? It attracts critters. And we're talking about not being a nuisance to our neighbors. We are on, in urban environments, so we don't wanna attract critters by putting meat and cheese in there. We could, if we had a very active compost pile, we could compost an entire chicken, right? It would be no problem. It would break down, the microorganisms would take care of it, it would be safe. But another problem is that, that if you have meat and it didn't actually get the temperatures that it needed, you might be in the danger zone for pathogens, right? Because it's meat that has been sitting at somewhat room temperature for two months in your backyard. So that, that would, that's another reason to consider um, meat and cheeses and bones. To not break them down. Commercial, commercial folks do compost, like I've seen uh, dairy operations where if a dairy cow passes away, they'll put it into a compost system. However, that compost is not going onto your vegetable garden after that, and it's also a super managed system. 
So that and an entire cow will disappear in a compost system. So it can be done. It's just not something to do. You have a lot. I've heard a lot of questions about citrus in the past. Uh, Vermicomposting worms don't like citrus so much. So I hear. I'm not. I'm not here to teach you about worm composting. That's just what I heard. Um, but you can put citrus in your compost pile. I have never seen my citrus again when I'm sifting my compost pile, ever, as long as it's actively composted. Now I wouldn't, if you are for some reason a citrus grower in Fort Collins, I wouldn't put all of your citrus scraps in there, right? Because you would throw the level off of carbon to nitrogen and not be able to break that down, but you could. Now a really good benefit is to cut up your citrus before you put it in your compost pile. Anything, the smaller something is before you put it in, the faster it's gonna break down, the better it's gonna break down. So cutting that grapefruit rind up in three or four pieces will help it pro be broken down. Know where your feedstock comes from. There are issues with antibiotics or dewormer or some herbicides even get into your compost system because you had a horse, you fed a horse alfalfa that had a pretty strong herbicide on it. The herbicide goes through the gut of that horse into the manure into your compost pile and we cannot compost out herbicides. It's the one thing that's really hard to compost out. And so I have seen gardeners bring me material that is herbicide damage on their vegetable garden because they had horse manure in their compost. So it's a good idea to ask if you're gonna get manure or if you're, or if you're feeding your own horses to think about what was maybe on there, if it's gonna transfer through the gut of that horse. So, um, so heavy metals can also be a concern, but mostly in biosolids. We don't really see heavy metal concerns in composting. Remember, know your compost is mature, so monitor it, let it cure for a long time. Uh, maturity is super important. And if it has too much ammonium, this will actually burn your plants. So ammonium, while being nitrogen and being a great fertilizer, if you are applying a lot of compost, um, you can see damage not only to plants that are existing, but also if you like, for example, try to plant a seed and you just put some raw compost down that was not cured, then the seed might not germinate properly because of that ammonium. Uh, nitrogen in your garden could be immobilized if there's too much carbon, we talked about that. And then pathogens, E. coli and salmonella, are destroyed in the process of proper composting if you're, if you're managing it, so make sure it's a mature compost. And then test your compost and your soil. Okay, so I told you there's a really expensive test for compost. And I just turned all of you off from testing your compost. That doesn't mean that you can't send it to someone. If you're making a lot of it, I would definitely do this. You could send it to CSU and get a compost test from the soil plant lab and water lab. And it costs, oh gosh, I should have looked this up before I came here. I think it's $37.50 to get a soil test and, a, and then a compost test. They would be separate tests you'd have to pay for. I would recommend definitely as a soil scientist and not even like if I stand off my compost platform, definitely get your garden tested. Cause then you know how much organic matter is in your garden already. Another side note, I need to stop going on a tangent, but here I am. 5% organic matter is really all you want. And so some people get so excited about composting at home that they make compost and compost and they put it in their garden that's four by four. And before you know it, you're 95% organic matter. And that's not good. You want 5% organic matter. So that's a reason to soil test, to know how much compost you should really be putting down. Again, it's nice to test your compost. It's not always feasible and possible. If you're managing it, it should be good to go. Okay, I have a quiz for you guys. Okay, C to N ratio for compost. Back corner, 30 to one. What is the final stage of composting called? Curing, the final stage of composting is curing. Why is curing important? Kill pathogens, all right. So I said recolonize with microorganisms, which is what you were talking about, and then pH shifts, but killing pathogens is also an important part. Okay, what is the most challenging aspect to Colorado? Oh, oh that was quick. Moisture. What shouldn't we put in our compost piles? Now it's time for me to try to answer your questions. I'm terrified of this and you're gonna stump me for sure. We're talking about soil microorganisms when we talk about what's, what compo what's happening in compost. Mm. So do you need to add soil microorganisms? Do you need to have contact with soil microorganisms? The answer is no. 
But that's why we do like to touch the ground. It doesn't matter if we do or we don't. It will compost. Microorganisms are present, will be present in compost, even in a closed system. So the tumblers, I said, stink. But they are a closed system, and they're not touching the soil. And they still can compost. So you don't have to be in contact with soil. You don't need to add anything to start composting. I used to have people who would try to buy products from me to start get kickstart their compost. Not necessary. Don't buy products. This is free. This is your trash. So you don't need to do that. And some people like to throw a handful of dirt into compost. I also think that's completely unnecessary. You don't need to do that. So there's that answer. This is a soil science question about when is too much compost and how much compost can you add to your soil. And that's a, and that's a difficult question because you have to know where you're starting from, what your organic matter content is in your soil. But there are some general rule of thumbs that will get you into a safe range, right? If you're applying less than an inch on top of your garden every year, less than an inch, you're probably going to be OK. Because while you might be, uh, you're putting an inch worth of um, organic matter on your, in your soil, that organic matter is decomposed, it's broken down, it's taken up by plants, so it's not a year or a, a later still an inch of organic matter in your soil. Um, uh, granted, that's a very artsy or touchy-feely way of talking about it. Um, really, you would want to think about how many pounds of compost per 100 square feet or 1,000 square feet you're putting down um, and do some calculations in there to see to make sure you're not exceeding that 5%. So if you're interested more in that afterwards, we can talk one-on-one -on -one and I can try to guide you through that process. OK, so remember that time that I put a whole bunch of newspaper in the compost pile? Nothing happened, right? So nothing happened. I mean, nothing broke down. I could go there and I would see some like really gross, moldy-looking banana peels. Nothing happened, right? And, and so that's what I mean by too much carbon. I mean, in a system like that, that's a lot of carbon. I was putting a lot of newspaper in for a small amount of food material. Um, so that's what I mean when, when I say there's too much carbon. Now, if you had a compost that was 50 to 1, you would, de you would get decomposition. It would just be slower, and it wouldn't get hot. It maybe would get to 80, 90 degrees in the center of the pile, but it would be a lot slower. Um, but you would know this a little prior to that because the texture, like a lot of things that are going to be high carbon are really going to change the texture. And this is the artsy part of it, right? This is the art of composting. You know, when you think about adding, say, if someone added wood shavings, for example, you're really going to change that texture of the compost. Um, so if you want to be sciencey about it, you need to calculate it. And you can use five-gallon buckets to do it, to calculate to try to get to that 30 to 1 ratio. Um, and kind of put in, oh, I'm going to put in one bucket of this higher C. I'm going to put in five buckets of this lower C. And calculate about what your C to, to N ratio, ratio is there. Um, but if you, another really great way to think about it is like, um, we, we, well, I'm trying to think of a better way to tell you about it. So we used to say 3 to 1. And that's also hard, but three to one, brown to green. That's the most elementary way for me to, to talk about browns and greens. And that's dangerous. And the reason I told you this and not that is because if you're using sawdust as your brown, then you are going to have way too much carbon, right? So that's, that was what people used to say is three to one. So three parts leaves to one part, but the food scraps. She just bought a pH tester, and it was for her soil. And she's wondering if using that pH tester in her compost would be um, useful or if it would give you answers, right, about if something was mature or not. Remember I said during that curing phase, the pH goes to 7 or neutral. So you might say, have you finished your curing phase? Yes. Use your pH tester. Test it. You're at 7.2, 7.1. Safe to go. You probably did a good job of curing your compost. That doesn't tell you everything, but it's helpful. Absolutely. And pH testers are very cheap, and you can get them uh, really simple little kits for pH tests at home garden supply stores. There are some animal wastes you should probably avoid. And the number one is your pet's waste. And the only reason that's the number one is because no one really knows what's in your pet's food. So 
and what your pet ate when it was on that walk and it was that weird trash and you weren't watching him and all of a sudden he's chewing on something and you're wondering what the heck it was. Um, so if you did, so let's say you have a lot of dog waste in particular, um, there are some kits you can buy to enzymatically process your dog's waste that's kind of like composting but it's enzymatic and it's not to be used in your garden. You can process it, it's probably pretty safe, but you can put it on your peach trees or your, well, we don't have peach trees, apple trees or your, in your garden. So there are ways to process your pet's waste. It would just be different and I wouldn't put it in your compost. Everything else, well, yeah, so your pets, and of course some of you have horses as pets, but you can use, use their manure. So great question. That's a really good question, bindweed. Yes, they will really break, they w but you really need to get hot and you really need to make sure all of it got hot. And if you hate bindweed, which you should, I would just not put it in your compost pile. I put things, I'll put dandelions in my compost pile. Um, I'll put just about any other weed in my compost pile, but bindweed. Yes, yeah, so she had mentioned she had a passive compost pile. Yeah, and bindweed will grow in those passive compost piles and will grow into your curing compost pile, which is essentially in a passive, cool state. So yeah, good, great question. No, uh, the question is, will your compost spontaneously combust? <laughs> I have never seen it happen. Um, apparently, a lady says it will if you put it in a trash can. I have no idea what that's about, but it's possible. I've seen mulch piles. I've heard stories of mulch piles that have spontaneously combusted. They get really hot. Um, I, I've never seen compost get that hot or have heard of any stories of it burning. And I think the reason is, so think about a mulch pile. It's got tons of fuel. And there's not much fuel in your compost unless you're putting lots of wood chips in it or have a lot of really dry leaves, right? So you should be safe from spontaneous combustion. If you have backyard chickens, chicken droppings are very high in nitrogen. Yes, chicken, it's really great to incorporate high carbon things in with chicken. So one of the things is just to use the bedding. If you go online, there is studies as to the C to N ratio of just manure and also manure with bedding. That's a very standard thing for people to do is to incorporate their bedding when they're cleaning out chicken coops um, and use the bedding and, and the, the manure together. Oh, that's another great question. A lot of people think that their chickens will turn their compost. And they will. Well, you know, chickens always scratch downhill. So they're just, if you have a mound, they're going to flatten it. But that doesn't exactly equate turning a compost. But if you're talking about um, maybe a more passive style of composting, you might be successful with that method. Ooh, what are good resources you could find when you run into future problems? Um, well, there are a couple, f well, we talked in the, at the very beginning, we said that the Sustainable Living Association and also Gardens of Spring Creek teach classes in composting. And they're stationary as far as you could probably get someone on the phone to ask them those questions. Um, a mass, thank you, master, how did I forget master gardeners would be a great place to ask questions. Your local extension service, which is, an, which is master garden, gardeners are a leg of, right? Your local extension service should be able to answer any of those questions about composting. There are web resources, which I did not link for you, but you can find tons of web resources. Um, yes. Any, any, any other thoughts? Anyone else know a thought about? And I gave you, hey, and you can email me, and I'll answer you. Natalie.yoder at colostate.edu. If you are doing spring and fall cutbacks, and, uh, and you're cutting back things that are like Russian sage, caryopteris, really woody materials, the question is, if you cut it small enough, it'll be OK. And the answer is yes. Of course, if you're gonna make a if you're gonna make a pile um, and you had a, a source of high nitrogen, I mean, it would be fine. You wouldn't even have to cut it down very much, depending on the size of your pile. But if you're a home gardener and you're gonna include that stuff into your pile, you're probably gonna need to find an alternate source of nitrogen to add into that pile to make it work. So go get some manure somewhere. Great question. So the question is: Is six by six? <laughs> is six by six uh, about the size of a pallet? compost. It's a little smaller. On the top of my head, I can't remember how big a pallet is. Anyone know? Four by four, right? So they're four by four. 
The question is, you filled this four by, this is like a math question on one of those standardized tests. You have filled that four by four pallet area with four by four amount of compost. And how long will it take to break down? And what size will it be? Well, I can't do fast math, but it's gonna be 30% less than that original size. And how fast it breaks down, how fast it breaks down entirely depends on your management. So remember I said, when we looked at that chart, right, you could do it in 30 odd days, or you could do it in six months. So it really depends on your management of that system. But so, let's say you max it out, you're looking at a little over 30 days to break that down once it's all said and done. Oh, but then you have to cure for one to two months, exactly. Yeah, so you're looking at three months max, two to three months. That is not a question for me. Well, I mean, okay, the question is, is there a commercial composter in our area? So first of all, yes, there are commercial composters. Um, Hagman's is a great place to take uh, your plant material and they turn it into compost it, but you have to pay to drop it off and then you know pay to buy the compost ba back. Um, so compost at home. But if you're talking about a large amount of material, um, that might, might work. What, that's right, Weitzel's, where are they located again? And West Mulberry. And Hagman's is on like Prospect by I-25. So those are two locations that you can drop off material that they do commercial composting. Where do all those weird compostable, they say is compostable, but I don't think they're actually that compostable cups go? Um, probably to A1 Organics, and they have a facility out in Eaton. So if you're uh, signed up for a collection service with a hauler who would they'd take it out to uh, Eaton, it's about 30 miles east of Fort Collins, and they have the windrow system that Natalie was talking about. So they're very commercial. They've got all that you know heavy-duty equipment turning it, and, and that that's um, probably where it's going. And that's absolutely key to composting those things. I didn't mention that, but if you are getting those compostable utensils, I wouldn't try putting them in your home compost. I have had very bad luck with that, but commercial composters can get a lot hotter, they're a lot more efficient, and they can compost some of those. I know that CSU has a system, it's called Oscar. Actually, I think that's just his name. And it's this big in-vessel system with a big auger that turns it, and they put raw material on one end, and by the time it makes it through the vessel, picture like a shipping container. By the time it makes it to the other side of the sh long shipping container, it's, uh, it goes out to the field to cure. So there are these kind of in-vessel projects going around the, in the US. The question is, can your microorganisms die if they get too hot? And yes, they can, um, but what we see is if that happens and you turn a pile, it, they repopulate. So it's not, yes, they, that's actually something that they do every time you, before you turn the piles. They've died because it got hot and because where they were it didn't have quite enough food, so they die off. You turn the pile, you're feeding the small population that's still alive, and they repopulate again. Two great questions. The first one is, do you surface apply a compost or do you work it into your soil? You can do either, depending on your system, and if at that time when you're applying it, you can work it into your soil. If you work it into your soil, the real benefit of that is that it's staying moisture because it's not on the surface, and that the small amounts of nitrates and ammonium, which you do want, that is a really good nitrogen source for your garden, um, will not volatilize, they will not disappear, they will not leach out as readily as if you just left it on the surface. Um, and, and it stays a little bit more alive if it can stay moist. And so I like to mix mine in, though there's many times when I don't mix it in because I don't want to till my soil and I don't want to disturb the earthworms or whatever's under there, so I just put it on top. So either are fine. The second question is, how often can you apply compost? And really wants to, it's slow release fertilizer. It's very slow to break down. The microorganisms have to work at all these complex amino acids and proteins in order to turn them into something a plant can uptake. So once to twice a year max. I mean, you could pl apply it in the spring before you plant and maybe apply it in the fall before you put a cover crop or something on, um, but one time a year would do it for you. Or even you could just apply a little handful per hole that you plant your tomato in. So depending on your system, great question. Okay, what creates an anaerobic environment? So anaerobic environment is a lack of oxygen. So normally it's created when you have too much moisture and not enough pore space to have oxygen in it. And the microorganisms in an anaerobic environment are completely different than aerobic microorganisms. And one of the big downfalls, I mean, there are ways to biodigest things in an anaerobic environment, but one of the big downfalls is that uh, there's methane is off-gassed in that process. Um, and that's a, green, a very powerful greenhouse gas. 
And then also it stinks. So those are the two biggest downfalls to that. And you won't be actively composting, so you won't get the heat, and you won't get the disease suppression, and you won't get the um, weed, the, the weed seed kill off. But so it's not dangerous, but it stinks, and it's not very useful, and it produces methane. So that's a great question. In my opinion, what is the next important step um, in, in this community regarding compost? And I think that the city is already, they already know what the next important step is, which is citywide composting. So that people, while you guys are here interested, you're like 100 people, and Fort Collins is 150,000. And so in order for us to really divert all that, that you know, food waste, we need to have some way that it's really easy for people to get rid of it and for it to be composted. So I think that would be a great next step. And I know a lot of cities around the US are doing it. And I think we're on track to hopefully do that one day. So the question is, I sometimes feel like I don't have the right things to make really good compost. Like I don't, for example, I, I said multiple times, I, sometimes I don't have leaves. I live in a rental place that doesn't have a tree on it, right? So how do I have leaves? Well, so there are, there is a leaf exchange and it's on the city's website. So you can get leaves that way. I have also gotten leaves just literally stopping landscapers that I saw with leaves in the back of their truck and saying, hey, give me those leaves. So that's a really great way to get some. Um, and then almost every dairy f where a lot of, there's a lot of dairy operations or people with cows that post to Craigslist often trying to get rid of their manure. So if you're looking for nitrogen, um, that would be a great way. What about cooked food? And cooked food is plenty compostable. Um, if it has lots of oils and fats in it, again, it attracts animals, but I have put, some leftover cooked food that was meat-free in my, my urban compost, and it's been fine. When you get leaves from people, do you worry about what they spray on their trees? Uh, there was a tree guy in here. What kind of bad stuff gets sprayed on trees that could be in your compost, tree guy? A lot of things. OK. So do you get worried? Yeah. Do I get worried? Moderately. I try not to worry too much. It's one of my mottos in life. But um, I'm more worried about horse manure uh, with herbicides than what's sprayed on trees, because that's what's going to affect my garden later on. There's just a lot of trace things and chemicals in our environment, and I'm, it's really hard to avoid a lot of them. But I'm most concerned with herbicides, which if any smart arborist sprayed a tree with an herbicide, I'd be really concerned about their sanity. So, so, that's, so that's one reason not to worry. How, um, organics, if you're talking about certified organic, which no one has a certified organic backyard, but they would not, they would frown upon you using lots of leaves from a neighborhood, but it's still even allowed in organics. So, so that's something to consider. Is it done on the ground in, in thin layers? So that's what it is. It sounds like it's composting done in thin layers on the ground. I mean, there's layer composting, there's sheet mulching, which breaks down over time, but you could compost in just about any way. So yeah, if you wanted to layer your materials really shallow on the ground, you could come and till them and mix them in that way. That would not be thermophilic. That would not be a hot compost pile, though. So that would be different if you were doing it that way. Sorry that I'm not super familiar with that term. I mean, I, I'm not super familiar with those, but it seems like if they're for septic tanks, they're probably for more anaerobic environments. So that's probably not the right microbes to be putting into your compost pile. Great question. So don't use septic tank starter. <laughs> if you live within 100 feet of an of a irrigation, or you are within 100 feet of an irrigation ditch, you cannot compost, actively compost in that location, but you could apply compost if it was a finished product. It shouldn't be damaging. It shouldn't leach anything. But you want to be really cautious still, because even though it's maybe a finished compost, if you have a lot of runoff and it's a sloped land, um, you want to try to you know, maintain as much protection from that ditch. So that might be a good opportunity, again, to increase either some sort of ground cover or hay bales or something like that that protects anything from entering into the irrigation ditch. That was a great question. And wells. So waters of the state. No one is coming around and looking at you. This is on your honor. And someone could catch you, and then you'd be in trouble. And it's just not good to do. So don't do it. That's a closed system. If you have a tumbler and you're near a creek, I'm not sure what the laws are on that, but it should be OK. You're a closed system. Yes. If you're using in-vessel compost piles, so if you're using something that's closed or maybe those plastic compost bins, you could get away not doing, not using more than one. You could just get away having one. But it would be, especially if you're producing a lot of stuff that you want to compost, probably in your favor to be actively adding to one and letting one compost until that's done and you've sifted it and used it and then you're actively adding to that one. So it would be in your favor to do two. 
You could you can cure it in a unit, you can cure it in a pile. You can Yes. Yes. Well, like I said, you don't even need that unit to compost, so, you know, it's definitely not necessary for curing. You could just cure as an open pile. I would not cure compost by putting it on your garden cuz that could defeat the fact, again, you could have too much carbon, too much nitrogen, it's not done curing, so you could stunt growth of plants or you could damage the garden potentially. So I would not cure by applying. Cure in a pile, in the pile that you composted in. Leave it there for a while. Thank you guys so much.